Goodness, good man, I'm telling you, you guys are so awesome. Uh, just a, a word from, you know, of, of, a, of a thought here, and I know you guys are, are conscious of the band and, um, and all that they do for us and uh, the way they bless our lives and the sacrifices that they make. But I know, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, Justin is a big part of the band, and uh, he's a big voice in the band, and a big part of the way the band sounds and the instrumentation and stuff like that, and all of a sudden have one of the leaders to be called out, which he's a power company guy, a lineman, and, um, and that means he's on call, and uh, if you're on the top of the list, when you get the call, you got to go. And, and so right before church today, I mean, right, right when they first started to get together to, to you know, go do what they're going to do today, he gets called out, and that changes everything. Because he's got a big part today of what's everything that's going on and songs that he sings and songs that they do and what they're going to do with other songs that he sings background and plays in and stuff like that. In other words, it's, it's, not, it's a big deal. And, uh, and they, but they just go right on and they just do. And it's, it sounded wonderful, didn't it? I mean, it sounded wonderful. Yeah, yeah, praise the Lord. I'm just telling you. I'm just, I'm saying all that to say to you how good God is and how, what a blessing it is to have a, a group of people that are so committed and so talented and so gifted that God can just bring out of them uh, what we, what would, what would encourage us and what would move in our lives and, um, and bless us. You know, it's just a, just a wonderful tribute to the, the, the talents and the abilities of God. It's, it's that old thing, and I know some of you won't even recognize what I'm talking about, but it's that, it's that old, anytime you have a need, just, just reach in and you'll uh, and, and get you some out. You know, it'll always be there, a reference to the widow and Elijah when she had the grain and was going to die and make the cake and feed her son and, and, then, and then die, and she made a cake for him, and because she did that, uh, she always had enough, and, and, and though the pot never ran over, it never ran dry. Just when she reached in, it was there. So we feel like the Lord's done that in our life. Even though our pot, we're not able to look at our pot running over and feel comfortable and say, oh, we have all we need for many years to come. Uh, we are, when we need it, we just reach in, and somehow God always provides it, uh, whether it's our band or our ministry or you guys or whatever it might take. And I praise the Lord for that. Jim and Deborah, you, you guys stand up. Okay, say something. That's awesome. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate that so much. And for those of you that are online and may not have been able to hear that, I know we have like mics up here and stuff like that. So all you guys that are whispering back there and stuff, it's going out online. Um, <laughs> those things are really super sensitive. I hate, you know, I don't know if y'all are aware of that. Uh, <laughs> But they are, they really are. Really, those things are so sensitive, I wouldn't even need this microphone here. But, of course, we obviously don't turn them up very loud because we don't care about y'all's whispers and stuff. So, <laughs> I mean, we're trying not to hear that. We just kind of want to have a little bit of essence of, you know, being somewhere, uh, not in some recording studio, so they can kind of hear your responses when you laugh at jokes and stuff like that. So it's not just... Um, so it's not just me standing up here saying something funny, and I'm going, <laughs> and then everybody online is going, "Is nobody there? What you know? What is he doing?" But it, uh, but that just kind of gives a little essence of of what is in there, and uh, yeah, but but it's, it may not be able to pick up what you say from the congregation. But for those that are watching, Deborah was just talking about Miss Pat, who did the signing during a couple of the songs about how much she enjoyed that and how much how blessed she was and uh if you have friends that are are hearing impaired uh, and they can read you know the signs that is a blessing and it's like singing with your hands is what it's what it is and it's another language really is what it is it's a language and so uh that's a good word yeah bill right Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that is amazing. Only God can make hands that can talk 
and eyes that can hear. That's a great, that's a good word right there. That's a good word. And I know anybody who knows anyone who's deaf or, or has anybody in their life, or if you are deaf and you can read lips or do things like that, you understand what that means to be able to hear with your, you know, hear with your eyes. And that's an awesome thing. So we praise the Lord, even in giftings uh, that we don't think about like that. And so we praise the Lord. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. We have several in our church who are uh, efficient with signs and they can do that uh, and be able to fluently con converse with anybody about anything. So it's, uh, you know, should the Lord send some deaf ministry into our church, we, we, we are available for all of that. And so it's good it's good to know that. So if you have some deaf friends, don't be afraid to bring them with you is what I'm trying to say. We started last week with um, some thoughts about uh, the birth of Christ and the fact that in the Gospels, which uh, I shared with you last week, that there are three of them really that are synoptic, which just means sign meaning to similar or alike and optic meaning to see that there are three of the Gospels that see things alike, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then we have the fourth Gospel. We call it the Gospel. It's the Gospel of John. And John carries the life of Jesus basically in his Gospel through seven major miracles that Jesus does. But in looking at the way life begins for Christ, we have Matthew and Luke who go back to some very uh, early details about angels and shepherds and, and Mary and Joseph and the donkeys and the cattle lowing and the cradle and the star and the rejoicing of the angels. And they go all the way back to the birth of Jesus and start with the beginning and come forward. However, John goes way back. John goes way back to in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So in other words, John zooms out the picture so that we can see that this babe that was born in a manger in Bethlehem was actually the infinite creator of the earth, and that this babe in a manger that seems so fragile and so mortal is actually the creator of the world that created the cradle he was born in. And actually, before the world was, was created, he spoke the word that created the world that didn't exist before he spoke the word. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, one of those <laughs> wild kind of thoughts. It's like, how long is eternity <laughs> kind of deals? You know, but, but it's good. I think it's good, every, you know, every once in a while to step back and zoom back and see the big picture and see that even though Jesus was born on this earth it, as an infant, that, he, that he, he was the infinite born as an infant. And, and, though, and, and Jesus didn't stay an infant. Jesus began to grow. And the Bible tells us just a tad or two about the fact that he became a young man and he grew in nurture and admonition of the Lord and and he, and he obeyed his parents, and he did all the things that he needed to do to become a grown man. And when he was 30 years old, he began to form his disciples and began to get them ready. And he began to call people to the work that he was doing. Everybody say, his invitation. His invitation. Jesus began to invite people yes. to come with him and to come and share the gospel, to come, come with him and come matter and make a difference in this world. So God, God began to invite. So Jesus was not an invader. Jesus was an invitation. Yeah. Jesus was, was heaven's invitation to us to join him, join God in what he's doing here on this earth. So Jesus then began to invite those that would be called to help him. And he sees, he comes to John the Baptist one day, and John the Baptist has two disciples, according to the scripture, that are standing beside him. And John looks at his two disciples that are standing beside him, and he points at Jesus who's walking down the road, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. So the one, John the Baptist, who was created to make the way for Jesus to come, now moves out of the way and points his disciples to the one that he is making a way for and steps off of the scene and out of the way. And those disciples look at Jesus and say, Master, 
Uh, Rabbi, where do you live? Where do you stay? And Jesus said, come and see. And so Jesus has been saying, come and see all of these years to us. Master, uh, what can you do in this? Come and see. Master, what, why do we need to receive you? Uh, come and see. Master, why, what can be done with this situation? Come and see. Jesus has been answering and putting forth the invitation. The whole, his whole life, our whole life, our whole ministry is wrapped around Jesus' invitation for us to come and see. And so as the disciples begin to come, Jesus begins to train them. And as he trains them, he gets this uh, conglomeration of guys that John t tells us about, you know, that uh, Philip comes and Philip uh, comes and, 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 and Philip helps him find uh, the disciple and, and uh, Andrew helps him find Peter. Um, Peter comes and Jesus says, I see a lot of potential in you and you're going to be called the rock. And we know the story of Peter. He wasn't perfect, was he? He had trouble. He had trouble controlling his speech, right? I know none of you have trouble controlling your speech. But, but Jesus chose Peter. You mean old cussing Peter? Yeah. Yeah, he chose Peter. Why? Because Jesus often sees in us things that we don't even see in ourselves. He sees the potential. And then Andrew, uh, then Philip comes along, and Philip finds a, a, a guy by the name of Nathaniel. And you remember what the Bible referred to Nathaniel. Nathaniel, the only really thing that it says about Nathaniel is that Nathaniel looks at Philip and Philip says, Hey, we found the Messiah, uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, as the prophets proclaim. And then Nathaniel said, uh, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? In other words, Nathaniel disses Jesus' hometown. Na Nathaniel says, uh, uh, you might need to reconsider that because as far as I know, nothing good can come out of that place. Uh, representing those people who look at things and get so enamored with the package that they miss the potential. They get so, nothing good can come out of that. That doesn't look like I expect it to, in other words. Jesus would never come from a place like that. Nothing good could come out of that situation. There are lots of things in our life that we overlook simply because we get enamored with the package. We get enamored with the presentation of the thing. And we miss the potential that is there. But Jesus saw potential in Nathaniel. And Jesus said, you know, come on with me, and if you'll come with me, let me tell you what we're going to be able to do. And Jesus lays out the fact that the miraculous will happen and great things will be going. And so Jesus is all ready with his men. He's fired up. He has this worldwide ministry going. He has this tremendous potential, and he's got all of his guys trained, and they're ready to step out the door and take the world, and they're going on a world tour, and it's going to be wonderful, and all of these disciples are going to play a big part in everything that Jesus is doing. And then as Jesus, step, <clears throat> as Jesus steps out the door, <clears throat> Jesus looks at his guys and says, oh, uh, wait a minute, guys. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a, there's a wedding right down here. Mm. Hey, guys, we need to stop off at the wedding before we, before we get on this tour. And I can see, you know, the disciples being disappointed by this. Can you? I mean, the disciples would probably feel like us. Jesus, we've been training for this thing for, for, for days and months, you know, and we've been preparing for this, and now... We're ready to get started on this thing. You know, you have a limited time. You only have a little while. You said you weren't going to be here forever and that we only have a very short period of time to get this thing pulled off. And the world needs you. The world's looking for a Messiah and a Savior. The world's looking for a king that can be king of the Jews and king of, king of life. And you need to get yourself out there and you need to present yourself and so let's go. Why, why would we go down to a little wedding down the street? And Jesus looks at him and says, well, uh, I RSVP'd. And I made a mistake to RSVP into a place where Mama is. Mama's going to the wedding. And so, you know, Mama's going to be down there. And if I don't stop by there, it's gonna, Mama's going to get all over me about, you know, about that, so I can't, I can't dis, I can't dis my mama, 
and she's going to be at the wedding, and so we're going to need to we're going to need to swing in there and stop by the wedding, you know. And, and, and so Jesus and his guys, and on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And he asked, and he said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Mine hour has not yet come. That's always been a little, uh, that's an uncomfortable reply from Jesus, Right. I mean, that's an awkward response. That's, that doesn't seem like Jesus to say something like that to his mom. It, it, it's almost disrespectful uh, sounding. To, when you just read it blatantly like that, it's, uh, you know, it's just a, a, one of those responses that Jesus makes, but he does. He says, my hour's not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were there, sit there, six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. There's something to be said about that, isn't it? <laughs> they, he just said, fill them, and they filled them to the brim, man. They went over, boy. They, they wanted the whole deal right there. Look at your neighbor and say, they wanted everything. <laughs> Yeah, they wanted everything. They filled it to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. Now you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So Jesus chooses at a little tiny hole in the wall to do his, to do his biggest miracle, one of the, one of the miracles that according to the scripture, uh, becomes an essence for everybody to see that he is the Messiah. One of these notable big things that when people heard about this and when people saw this, they looked at Jesus and they said, man, he's, he has to be special because that's that guy that turned the water into wine down in, down in, down in Cana. We've heard of all of the things he's done. And that was a tremendous miracle, and it manifested forth his glory. And the Bible said when his disciples saw it, that they believed that he was who he said he was because they saw this miracle in Cana of Galilee. The big question becomes, uh, why here? The big question becomes, in a place called Cana, and I know that you guys are not you know, Bible map scholars or anything like that, or or even modern map, map scholars. But Cana is thought to be a little tiny spot in the road between Capernaum and Nazareth, Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. And if you went there today, the, whoever took you there would not even be able to actually take you there. You would say to someone, the cab or the Uber or whoever you were, <laughs> you'd say, take me to Cana. I want to see where Jesus turned water to wine. I want to see that first miracle of Jesus. And they would take you to a wide spot in the road, and they would say to you, well, we think uh, this is here that it happened, but, uh, but we don't really know for sure because we don't even really know where Cana is. And so what I'm trying to say to you is that in this first miracle that Jesus did that had such drastic results, such results that the world began to see the glory of God, yeah. The majesty of Christ, that it was done at this little no-name place. You think Jesus is trying to say something by that? Jesus performs his, his first miracle at a common little place, a common little town that really doesn't matter because no one can even remember where it is. And then, of course, the couple that's there that are getting married, this is just some young couple. This is just a nameless young couple. It was a young couple that said, you know, we're having our wedding, and, you know, our wedding just wouldn't be the same if Jesus didn't come. Yeah, yeah. Let's invite Jesus to come to our wedding. 
Now, I'm going to remind you that sinners love Jesus. If you read in the Bible, every group that Jesus ever ran into, no matter whether they were tax collectors or whether they were scientific people or whether they were just common people that worked in common lives and common places, they all loved Jesus. When Jesus spoke, they were enamored by what Jesus said. They were captivated and drawn to Jesus. Thousands of them would sit on a hillside and just listen to Jesus talk about the kingdom of God and, and, the, and, the, and the parables and the law and, the, and just anything he wanted to talk about. They just wanted to hear his voice and they would follow him. And they invited him to weddings, and they invited him down to the local taverns. Hey, Jesus, come have a drink with me. I could. It, they loved Jesus. Sinners loved Jesus. It was the religious folks that had a problem with Jesus. It was the, the, the religious uh, stalwarts. It was the traditionalists. It was, it was religion that had a problem with Jesus. It wasn't the common folks. And so here is Jesus invited by a nameless couple to a nameless place, performing a tremendous miracle uh, that called attention to his glory and made everybody know that he was on the scene and now he was beginning his ministry. And he did it not in Jerusalem, not in the capital of the world, not downtown, not in some big temple somewhere, not at some big religious spot or some big political spot or some big military spot. He did it at a no-name place with no-name people at a no-name time in life. He performed his first public miracle and started a ministry. And I say, wow, Jesus. I say, wow. I say, that's got to be significant, you know. And I'm, and I'm amazed that Jesus was there, actually. You know, when I read it, I'm not, not that Jesus would be at a wedding now. I, I, it's not amazing that Jesus would be at a wedding because Jesus cares about us. He, he, our celebrations in our life are important to Jesus. Look at, look at your neighbor and say, you're important to Jesus. Yeah, you're important to Jesus, and your life is important to Jesus. I'm just, I'm just wowed by that, and I'm just uh, thinking that this is a significant thing because not the fact that he was at a wedding, but the fact of when it was that he was at a wedding. The fact that he would take time out at the very start of this world tour, having only limited time to get this thing accomplished, I'm just surprised about the fact that he would take the time to stop down and spend an afternoon at a wedding of people that he didn't even say their name, so it doesn't have anything to do with the people. It's not the importance of the people that Jesus wants us to see because he didn't even name them, and it's not an important place uh, Cana is not even named anymore, so it has nothing to do with the place and it has nothing to do with the people. So it must have something to do with what it means, with what Jesus wants us to see about the common things of life. Yeah, yeah. In this little common place, at a common time, with common people, Jesus shows up in the in the ordinary. You know, I can't think of a greater message for Christmas than than uh, the miraculous coming to the mundane, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the greatness coming down to the simple, uh, the complex visiting uh, the ordinary in life. See, we all think we're ordinary, and we think God couldn't care about the ordinary. Why, the wine runs out. Let me, in the Bible, wine is always symbolic for joy. And the joy of the Lord is my strength, you know, and Anytime you see wine in the scripture, especially in at times where it's where it's spoken about about the about the the wine and and it's and what it does and it represents, it, it always is a representation of joy. And so, what do you do when your joy runs out? What do, what do you do when your when your joy is gone? Jesus comes to a wedding and all of a sudden. Uh, they're out of wine. I mean, at a, at a, uh, they, they, they're coming. Everything's good. <laughs> Everything's great. A wedding's going wonderful. The people are happy. Everything's enthusiastic. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, something happens, uh, and, and it kills and stops the, the joy. It stops the flow of everything in life, like Uncle Louie coming to the party about half drunk, you know. 
I mean, you have these kind of people in your life, right? You have these, we have these killjoys that take away everybody's fun, right? You have these cosmic, uh, Aunt Susie brings whoever it is with her, and she's got to preach to everybody about what it means to be saved, even though she's about half tanked herself and all this kind of, I mean, yeah, you know, you know, these albatrosses that show up right in the nick of time to take away everybody's joy and to run everybody out of the party. And so Jesus is at this wedding and, and, and a no-name place, no-name people, and they run out of wine at the party. And, 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 and I just want to know, why were you there, Jesus? Now, I'm going to show it to you in one verse because that one verse that we just read shows you exactly why Jesus was there. And here it is, and let me just show it to you. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited. Everybody say invited. invited. And was in, Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Why did Jesus go? Because Jesus was invited. Do you know that God will go anywhere that he's invited. And that's why I ask you, you know, somebody said, uh, I think Tanya asked me, she said, um, what would we put on, on Facebook as a, like a one-line description of uh, what you're going to be sharing so that people can know what it's going to be about? And I said, uh, just put this up there. Have you invited Jesus into your Christmas this season? Because Jesus will go wherever he's invited. Look at your neighbor and say, wherever. 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 Yeah. Not just to the church services. Not just to some mountaintop experiences. Jesus doesn't just go to you, with you to spiritual places. Jesus doesn't just go to the mountaintop experiences of life. What does the Bible say? The Bible says he'll walk with you in the valleys. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. And you comfort me in the bad places, in the low places, in the dangerous places, in the confused places, in the chaotic places of life. Jesus will go where he is invited. Have you ever had Jesus show up in your automobile? You're driving down the highway and all of a sudden your Toyota becomes a temple of God, you know, or your Chevy becomes a chapel for God. And you're going down the road and the presence of God just shows up so powerfully in the cab of that vehicle uh, that the tears just begin to pop out of your eyes. And if somebody was in there, their first question would be, what's wrong with you? Well, Jesus has shown up in the mundane not in the temple somewhere, but just wherever I am and wherever I've invited him. Have you ever had Jesus show up while you're washing dishes? Yeah. All of a sudden, you're standing there and you got your hands down in the water and the suds are there. And the pots and the pans are clanking and all of a sudden, boom, here comes something just manifesting, yeah. rising up in you. And it's almost like you're lifted in the spirit yeah. by what? By, by God showing up in the mundane of life. Yeah. Not, no, 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 no. Not in a building somewhere that's got a cross on it. Not where you got to go down and, and get with him. Yeah. But he comes where you are into the simple, ordinary, mundane, no name, no reason. You're nobody. Okay. But he cares about you and loves about you, and God will go wherever he is invited. He'll show up in the shower. He'll show up walking down the street. He'll show up pushing a cart down the aisle at the store because he's invited, and we invite him. And he shows up because he's welcomed. One of the reasons why we do what we do in, with our praise team. While we try to lead you to rejoice and to lift your hands and to, and to, and to sing with the top of your voice, to, to clap your hands and wave your hands is we want to say to Christ, Jesus, you're invited into this place. You are welcomed here. We want you here. Jesus, come here. We're singing to you. We're praising you. We're welcoming you. We're inviting you. Jesus, come into this place and inhabit our life. You are welcomed in this place. And Jesus will come and celebrate 
anywhere he's invited. So what I'm asking you is, uh, have you invited Christ into your Christmas this year? Because I'm going to stress to you that you have to live with what you invite. Are you hearing me? Now, this is more significant than in just a sentence, all right? You hear what I say? Have you invited Christ into your life? And Jesus was at the wedding because Jesus and his disciples were invited. Jesus will come anywhere he is invited. Have you invited Christ into your Christmas this year? Or do you have guests at your wedding that may not be good for you, but they're there because you have to live with whatever you invite into your life? If you have invited stress, guess what's going to be there? Stress is going to be there. You say, how do I invite stress into my life? Dear stress, please come into my life. No, you make choices that invite stress into your life. You go down to Walmart and you buy everything your beady little eyes can get a hold of. That'll that'll invite some stress because just as soon as that bill comes in, boom, stress is there, right? So you have invited, you have done activities in your life that invites stress to come in. But have you invited the Prince of Peace into your life? Because if you invite the Prince of Peace in your life, I'm just saying, if you invite stress, stress is coming into your life. If you invite the Prince of Peace, then Jesus is going to show up as the Prince of Peace in your life. If you invite discouragement into your life, guess what discouragement is going to do? Discouragement is coming to the wedding. Discouragement is going to show up in your life. But have you invited the Prince of Glory to come into your life, you know, and, and remove those things out of your life? I'm just saying that, 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 we, have, we must be careful because Jesus will go wherever he's invited and, and, and whatever we're, we invite into our life, we have to live with. And, and one other little kind of thought about that in that vein, and that is if you're going to invite Jesus into your life, uh, you're going to have to make room for Jesus. Because see, your life may already be filled with others that have been invited. Now, they might be wedding crashers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, the what's the Owen guy uh, and the, the and the guys that crashed the wedding wedding crashers. Yeah, you know Owen Wilson was Owen Wilson. Yeah, I'm old. See, I got to yeah, got to get rid of some of that stuff. Got to get rid of some of those uninvited guests in order to have room for Christ in your life. Right? I mean, some things are going to have to go out of your life. Some of those unwelcome guests in your life, uh, uh, who, who, uh, what would those guests be? Well, fear would be one of those guests that don't need to be there. Pride doesn't need to be there. Guilt doesn't need to be there. Blame doesn't need to be there. And, and when they ran out of wine, and when, and, when the, and when joy was gone, when they ran out of wine, Mary knew what to do. This should answer once and for all the question, Mary, did you know? The answer is yes. Mary did know. And thank goodness Mary was there because she knew exactly what to do. She said to them, as soon as she saw what was happening and they were out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. I love the way the Bible puts it because because these people were filled with expectations. Their expectation was what? Their expectation was that there would be plenty of wine for the whole reception of everything. So they're walking around with their red solo cups and, you know, (laughs) they're... They're just not caring about how much they're consuming. I don't know if it's a bunch of more. If, if there were lots of people there that, that they didn't anticipate would actually come to the party or whether these people were just big drinkers uh, or both, you know. But for some reason, uh, as they walked to the bar, uh, they got there and the bar was closed. Now, why was the bar closed? Because the bar was out of wine, Right? 
So their expectation was they were going to be able to get more at the bar, but now their expectations have been dashed. Much like much like the religious world expected Jesus to come as some superstar. The religious world was looking for Jesus to come on top of a mountain at some temple somewhere and some uh, king or leader or potentate. The world expected Jesus to be Superman, and here comes Jesus showing up like Clark Kent, you know. And the world missed Jesus because the world was looking for Jesus in the wrong way at the wrong time, wrong, wrong space. I'm just saying that, you know, here's Jesus at a wedding, and the wine runs out, and the mother of Jesus looks at Jesus and says, they have no wine. Now, this seems to be a request, right? But notice the sentence up here. They have no wine. Uh, there's no question mark there. It's like one of those sentences that a statement is made that's really not a request. It really is a statement. A, state, a statement, you know, it's a request in the form of a statement. They have no wine. In other words, Jesus, you need to, you need to do something about this. They have no wine. And then Jesus makes that kind of a, a coarse, um, harsh type of little statement that seems so out of a character for Jesus. Uh, Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Mine hour's not yet come. In other words, Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus, said, Jesus, they have no wine. They are out of resources here. And Jesus says, who cares? I mean, isn't that what he's saying? Yeah. He's looking at her and he says, I know, Mom, you just said to me they have no wine. But really, that's none of my business. They should have planned better. Who cares? And then notice what Mary does. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says, do it. Notice that she doesn't say anything else to Jesus. And notice that she doesn't say this to Jesus. She says it to the servants. Servants standing over there out of the way. Hey, guys, whatever he says, j just do it. Mary says that because she knows that until, until they do something, he's not going to do something. She could beg and she could plead and she could get on her knees. She's already informed Jesus that they're out and that she feels like he ought to do something about it. But, but, she, but she then learns quickly that it's not her that's going to be able to encourage Jesus to do something, to get involved. See, first, Jesus was invited, and Jesus has to be invited, but now Mary's trying to get Jesus involved. So what do you do when the joy's gone out of your life? Well, you, you invite Jesus, but once Jesus is invited, then we have to get Jesus involved, right? right, right. So Jesus is standing there. He's invited. He's in the presence. He knows what's going on, but he's sitting there, and he's not going to do anything. It looks like to me he's not going to do anything. He just said, Mom, I don't care that they're out of wine. What, what is that to do with me? I don't have, I'm not the caterer around here. Nobody expected me to bring the wine. Oh, what, did I forget to go down to Big Lots and get the wine or something? You know? No, I'm, I mean, it doesn't matter to me. This is not my problem. And Mary looks at servants over there and says, hey, whatever he says, just do whatever he says. Because Mary knows in her heart that Jesus is not going to get involved until they get involved. Jesus is not going to take over and perform this thing without any involvement of the others in their life. You see, Mary knew what it meant to be a servant. You remember this? Mary had had a vision in her, in, in her early life about nine months ago. No, no it would be about 30 years and nine months ago. When Jesus was born, Mary had an experience with an angel. You remember this? There was an angel that came to visit a virgin. And, and the angel said, God is going to place in the womb of a virgin a child that is going to be the savior of the world. And then you're going to birth this child and you're going to name him Jesus and he's going to save his people from their sins. And she said, Mary said, Lord, how can this be? Because I've never even known a man. I've never had any 
sexuality or relations or anything with any man. So how can I have a baby? And the angel looked at Mary and the angel says, don't worry about it, Mary. It's the Spirit of God that's going to come to you. And the Spirit of God is going to hover over you. And the Spirit of God is going to plant inside of you that seed that is going to grow. And, and, and God's going to take care of the details. And do you remember what Mary said? Mary said, behold, I'm your servant. The common word here is servant. Mary knows what it means to be a servant. In other words, God's going to work through the servant. God's not performing a miracle by himself without, without a servant involved in it. And here at the wedding, Mary reflects back on the fact that now Jesus is being asked. Jesus is no longer a baby in a manger somewhere. Jesus is a full-grown man standing at a wedding about to start a ministry. And Mary says, Jesus, they need a miracle. You need to, you need to do them a miracle. And Jesus looks at her and says, I, I, who cares about that? And then she goes, ding, what I need is a servant. Because I remember God works through servants. That he doesn't just jump out to here and do things on his own. He works through service. And he's not going to do anything until they do something. And so whatever he says to you guys, how about doing it? I mean, this miracle's hanging on what you do. And all I'm saying is we sit here wanting God to do miracles in our life. We sit here wanting God to fill our life up with joy and enthusiasm and happiness. And we're standing over here with our arms folded, looking at God, saying, God, fill me up with joy. I need some joy in my life. And God says, I'm not going to fill you with joy until you rejoice. Once you start rejoicing, <laughs> then I can fill you with joy. Once you get involved, God, I need some peace in my life. Stand over here with my arm. I need the removal of fear in my life. I need for you to do great things in my life. Well, he's not going to get involved until you get involved. We have the audacity to beg him to do things, and he's sitting there waiting on us to do what's necessary in order for him to invade the situation. Whatever he says to you, Mary says, guys, just, uh, just do that, which he's camp said to you and you'll be fine and now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of the purification of the Jews containing a lot of water 30 20 to 30 gallons it's pretty big isn't it yeah. pretty big old pots but the thing I want you to notice about the pots is how common they were they were pots used for ceremonial cleansing in, in other words these were just pots that were always there and these were pots that nobody noticed. These were pots that the, the people had passed by at this wedding, obviously, many times. The pots were just sitting there. Everybody say, right in front of you. The answer was right in front of you. The answer was not elaborate. The answer was not out there. The answer was not, let's go down and buy something. The answer was right in front of you. I think Jesus wanted to perform a miracle with something that was right there in front of him. Why the water pots? I mean, it's just, you know, why use the six water pots? Well, he could have used anything. But he chooses to use the common because what he wants to do is show you that the miracle is not in the elaborate, but the miracle is in the common things of life. We often miss the miracles of God because we're looking for the elaborate. We're looking for the glorious. We're looking for the mountaintop experiences of life. But God said, look in the common. You know, we may be missing the miraculous because we lose it in the common. And Jesus looks at these six water pots and, and they're there taking 20 or 30 gallons. And notice what Jesus does. <laughs> Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, <laughs> not with wine, but with water. They needed wine, and here's Jesus saying, get me some water. So Jesus is going to use something that they never expect. I mean, how many times have we asked for something that we think we need, and yet God gives us something else. 
Huh? What's water? We need wine. And he's talking about water. And so often we miss the miracles of God. Our joy runs dry because we think God's going to do something one way, and yet God does something the other way, another way, a significant way. And so they fill them up to the brim. And he said, okay, now guys, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And notice what happens there. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, look, look, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom. <laughs> I mean, my only thought there is that, okay, the guy, the master of the banquet, tasted the water that was made into wine, and he didn't know where it came from, but the servants knew. You see, most, yeah, right, most of the people who receive from the Lord have no idea where it comes from. I, I'm just saying to you that even though they don't know where it comes from, the servants know where it comes from. Faith knows how to draw out that stuff. See, see, the ones who receive joy, they never interpret the fact that this joy was once sorrow. And that God worked a miracle through sorrow to create a life that's now filled with joy. Or that, 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 that trust was at one time fear, but God worked in your life to turn fear into victory. Or that, or that, or that loss in your life that d devastated you down here, uh, God turned it, God worked a miracle and turned it into, into glory in your life. See, uh, the world never knows what God does with, to, to create the miraculous in our life. But the servants know because the servants experience those things. And, and when the master of the feast tasted the water that was made wine, he didn't know where it came from, but the servants knew. And he said to them, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests are well drunk, then the, in the then they set out the inferior, but you have saved the best to last. When he tasted, he said, this is the best stuff. You've saved the best stuff, which it is, just makes me uh, nervous as a Baptist, uh, a former Baptist. I mean, I'm, I grew up in a Baptist church and a Baptist tradition, and, you know, we Baptists, we're teetotalers, and we don't drink anything like that at all, and, uh, and it makes me, yeah, right, it makes me uh, it makes me nervous to think that this was uh, intoxicating brew here, but it seems to be really. It seems to be because the master said there's a reason why people put the good stuff out, and then when they get all, everybody about half tanked and they can't tell the difference uh, between the good and the bad, then they put out the the, be the bad stuff. But you've done it just the opposite. Um, you have kept the good stuff to last. And, and I'm just thinking, could it be that God does the same thing? Could it be that the, your best days are ahead of you and not behind you? I'm just asking the question, could it be that God has a better future for you than your past has been? Could it be that God has a miraculous 2018 for you? And that the, that, that the year ahead is better than the year that has passed because God keeps the good stuff to the end and the worst stuff has already come and so God now has the best stuff for you. And, and the begin, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in, in him. Let me just draw back one little simple thought and then, and then we'll, we'll quit. Um, it's interesting to me that Jesus used six water pots to perform this miracle. Now, I know you, you, many of you probably have never heard of scriptural numerics. Uh, you've probably been through it at some point if you've ever been in any study of the book of Revelation 
or any of the prophetic books, you've read some passages in Ezekiel and Daniel and so forth, they have numbers in them, and those numbers are used consistently. Well, there's a reason for that, and that is that one out of every five verses in the Bible has a number. And if that number means uh, something in Genesis, it means the same thing in Exodus. It means the same thing in Leviticus and Numbers, and it means the same thing in Revelation. So numbers appear all through the Word of God, and they're not happenstance. They're part of the inspired Word of God. The numbers don't come out of thin air is what I'm telling you. They're, they're chosen by God just as every other word is chosen by God. So God doesn't just say, oh, let's see, how many was it? Oh, give me a number, man. Give me a number. No. no, he's very precise. Six is the number for man. Six is one short of seven. Seven is the number of perfection. It's the number of completion. It's God's number. Six is the number used for man, and seven is the number used for God. Because the weakness of man is always one short of the glory of God. We never can get to seven. We, we, we need a plus one to get to God. Jesus and me. Jesus uses six water pots. The number for man. Could it be that the reason Jesus uses six when he needs seven is because the seventh pot is you? Could Jesus be wanting to fill you right now? Could Jesus be saying, I need one more pot. I have six and they're full. I'm waiting for you. I'll fill you. I'll change you, right? I was, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Tanya was saying something between songs up, uh, while they were while they were performing and uh, it's on it's on you go to YouTube it's on there it was a couple of weeks ago and she was just talking and introducing and kind of flowing with the song and she said something about uh, God 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 performed a miracle so you could be a miracle God perform life so you could have life. And she went through about four or five different things like that. And I thought to myself, boy, that is so true, isn't it? I mean, the reason God fills you is so that you can be a miracle. You experience a miracle because God needs a miracle in you. Could it be? Could it be the reason that Jesus used six pots when he needs seven is that you're the seventh pot? And God wants you to be the miracle? God wants to fill you yes, yes. if you'll invite him because he goes where he's invited. Where you leave this place and you and God uh, are, are together, where you and God, he manifests his glory with you and for you and with you because you know he goes where he's invited. So I'm going to just invite you to say to the Lord, you know, hold your hands up, clap, whatever it might be. Wave them, say, Jesus, come into this place. Here I am right here. So he'll know he's welcome.